So um, I thought I'd just start, just um, tell you a little, about, a little bit about Pusher, um, just as kind of context. Who's kind of used Pusher just as out of interest for myself? Okay, not too many. Who's heard of Pusher? Okay, a few more, that's cool. Okay, so the idea of Pusher, um, Pusher's a cloud service. Um, the idea is to make it really easy for people to do real-time, make real-time applications on the web. Um, and so we provide some JavaScript, um, which is, you can embed in your web page, and it enables the browser to make uh, to establish a WebSocket connection um, to one of our servers. And Push is also used by other clients, so people are connected to Push from mobile phones, from uh, iOS devices, from um, OS X applications, like many bar applications that want to receive real-time updates about state. Um, so there's kind of all sorts of different clients. And then you can, from a client, uh, you can then subscribe to the channels that you're interested in. So the idea is to, it's pub sub. So um, you're not sending a message to a given user, you're merely sending a message to a channel. And then whoever's listening on that channel will, will receive a message. Um, so the browser can subscribe to one or more channels, um, ditto for any other device. And then you have a simple REST API to, make, um, to, send, uh, to send messages um, two channels. So those messages are simply kind of JSON, JSON messages, um, and you really free to do whatever you want. Um, we layer some extra things on top to do authentication and kind of do presence so you can see who else is subscribed to the same channel. Um, but that's kind of the core functionality. Um, so just to give you a couple of um, examples of how people are using this. Um, these guys made a great application called Word Squared, which is a kind of massively multiplayer um, Scrabble board. I think if this was in real life, it would be kind of hundreds of acres in size. Um, it goes on forever and ever and ever. And the way they do it is that each, uh, when you're looking at this, you subscribe to a very small section of this world, and then anyone else playing <coughs> tiles, um, you know, those tiles are automatically pushed to your screen. So that's great. Um, People are uh, using Pusher for kind of notification APIs. So this is a, like a dating site around uh, your last FM data, and um, they're kind of using it to, to push updates in real time. Um, SlideShare recently launched um, something called Zipcasts, which is kind of an online meeting thing. Um, when the organizer changes the slide, that slide changes automatically propagated to all users. Um, so they're using Pusher to power that. They're also using power uh, Pusher. Uh, to power the chat and to um, show the list of the participants <coughs> in the chat. So that's kind of a quick overview of what it is to give you some context. Any questions at this stage? Okay. So what I've got is about five uh, different kind of examples, um, chronologically really, the, in the order that we kind of did things, um, just to kind of give you an idea of the way we're using Redis. Um, Nothing kind of earth shattering, but I think, but hopefully, you find you know interesting, interesting different applications. So, what's on the menus? Um, just yeah, five different things. Looking at data, some some, some stuff about how we handle statistics, um, how we kind of uh, build a scalable system by auto assigning roles to different parts, of different components in the system, um, using pub sub messaging and kind of some synchronization stuff. Yeah. Did you start with Redis? Um, we did start with Redis. Um, yes, in fact, the very first thing we did um, was we needed to add uh, kind of authentication to the system. And at that point, Pusher was an extremely simple piece of software. And all we needed to store was kind of uh, uh, tokens, so kind of a, a key and secret for each application. Um, so we stuck that in Redis, made a lot of sense. Um, the whole, you know, it was extremely fast. We knew that was one of the, that would be an important feature going forward. So it was the speed, it was the simplicity of Redis. Just chuck the key in, fetch it, no messing about with database. And also, um, we were building this on top of the event machine, which is the Ruby kind of non-blocking um, node twisted type thing. Um, and so there were there were good non-blocking libraries for uh, for event machine, which meant that yeah, that was that was good to get started with that. So that's so we started off using Redis uh, for those kind of applications. And then um, a few months later, we kind of decided to go forward with Pusher and try and productize it. And so one of the first things we built um, was uh, some stats collection so that we could 
you know, understand the usage of the system and to eventually build people for <coughs> the usage of the system. Um, and so the two uh, kind of important things that we thought, okay, these are the things, these are obviously things we need to, to measure. Um, the number of messages that have been sent, obviously, and the number of connect open connections people have at any given point in time. Um, those are the kind of two constraints. And so we kind of use that data to provide, give people pretty graphs which they really like, and they can kind of drill into this and see. And it's actually quite a nice way of getting fairly real time information about the usage of your application. Um, so at the top, you're seeing the, the rate, the message rate, um, and then below that, there's the number of connections. Um, and then at the bottom, you've got a kind of histogram for the number of uh, messages sent per day, which is kind of. Um, so our approach to do this, obviously there are a lot of message, messages being sent in the system um, and we wouldn't want to kind of make a database write or write some information for every single message going through. So the first thing we do is we collect the data in memory. So as much as possible we just kind of keep, keep counters in memory about how many messages are going through the system and that kind of thing, um, and kind of latency and all sorts of different things. Um, and then we periodically flush those to Redis which is great, it's very fast, non-blocking, just get it out there, get it onto, out into Redis. And then we have um, a kind of background process that pushes, that pulls that data out and um, assembles it and pushes it into a, into a MySQL database. So just a little bit more about that. Um, this is a kind of extremely simplified view of the <coughs> architecture pusher. So you've got, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got um, API processes. This is where you make your REST API calls to. They're just uh, really simple kind of uh, Sinatra processes. Um, we've got a message bus in the middle, which I'll go into a bit more in, a bit later on. Um, and then on the right-hand side, those, they're called socket servers. So they're, they're the processes that you establish a persistent connection to um, and subscribe to channels. Um, and so we've got the system, we've got lots of messages going through it, um, we've got all those processes of collecting information in memory, um, pushing it to Redis, and then we're synchronizing it again. I think that's basically what I said before, so it's probably unnecessary. Um, <laughs> but I'm kind of a visual kind of guy, so there's lots of pictures in this attendance because of that. Um, synchronizing stats collection. So this is quite important. The, the idea is that um, We'd like to, um, especially for stats like uh, the number of connections you've got open at any given point in time, we'd like to kind of flush that data at the same time, more or less, um, across the system. So there are multiple processes on multiple different boxes, you know, and so we, what we didn't want to do was rely on kind of timestamp kind of approach for this. Um, so what we ended up doing was, um, so as before, we've got all these processes, they're collecting information in memory, um, so we have a central process that basically sits there and every, whatever the interval is, one minute, whatever, um, sends uh, the current timestamp to the message bus and that gets sent out to all of the processes in the system. Um, so that's a kind of a trigger for them to write the data at that, at that point. I mean, obviously everything's asynchronous, so it's never going to be exactly the same, the same time, but kind of to all intents and purposes, um, it kind of synchronizes things quite well. Um, and then we're using incrementers for a lot of this data because you don't have to worry about simultaneous access to, to, to keys. So all of the processes can just increment uh, the various you know, stats that they're interested in, uh, increment them against Redis, um, <coughs> which is what I've got there. Um, in the key, the way we write it, so the key, the key includes the application ID. In most cases, uh, it's relevant to the application and also the timestamp, which is the timestamp that was received from the central process that pinged out to everybody. So that all of these, so that all of this data can then be aggregated and it will all kind of correspond to the same timestamp. Um, that's two out of the way. Okay, and then the next one is um, kind of related. So um, kind of if we go back here, we've got this process that is um, periodically sending this, um, this kind of heartbeat message to record the, to flush the data. Um, and so initially we just had this as a central process that was responsible for doing that. Um, the problem with that is it's, you know, you have to configure which process is responsible for that task and you have to make sure it's deployed to the right server and human error comes in, things go wrong, um, and if that node fails for any reason, then you system. So 
<coughs> in general, um, we'd like to avoid all that kind of monkeying about. Um, and so we'd like to be able to take this process that's responsible for stats and, um, and kind of um, make that a bit more, a bit more uh, tolerant. So who moves the data into stats? <coughs> okay, so it doesn't really matter who does this task. This task just needs to happen. It needs to happen in one place. Can't happen in more than one place at the same time. Actually, this is um, this is this is different. Um, I'm forgetting what my slides are talking about here. Um, <coughs> the example of the slides is actually um, the which process is responsible for copying this data from Redis um, into SQL. But it's actually the same concern. Um, so it's the, the fact that you want one thing to happen in your whole cluster. Um, you want it to happen only in one place, but you really don't want to have to worry about configuring that and you know and, and responding to failure. <coughs> so how do we solve that problem? Um, so ideally the all the, the process can so the processes can also assign um, the process that's responsible for a given task. Um, so you know this is a kind of distributed locking problem um, and there are obviously Google's written about this a lot and lots of other people. Um, the Heroku guys actually came out with something called um, Doozer um, a few, maybe a week or two ago, um, which looks like it would solve this problem very nicely. It's kind of a, an implementation of Paxos written in Go, um, which I probably would have looked at if it had been available 12 months ago, but it wasn't. Um, so I thought uh, to myself, well, we're already relying on Redis as this kind of single central point. Um, and so, you know, surely we can just write it a lot on top of this. Um, which is fairly straightforward to do. Um, and there's an example actually in the Redis documentation about this. Um, and so the simple way of, of creating a lock, um, if you don't care about failure, is just to use set nx, which is uh, to set a value if it did not already exist, i.e. the key is empty. Um, and so if you do this, uh, you can set, um, you know, uh, set nx against a lock, um, and the value um, is the kind of expiry time of the lock. Kind of, um, there's more ways for money to do this, but that's kind of a conventional way of doing it. Um, so you acquire the lock. If Redis returned one, it means that that was successful. Um, then you, 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 know, you do whatever you need to do. Um, when you want to, when you don't no longer need that lock, you can delete it. Um, some other process comes along, acquires the lock. If another process comes along and tries to acquire it at the same time, it fails. <coughs> so fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, the deck lock case is kind of interesting, and it's quite an interesting uh, example of the way that you could write uh, kind of atomic um, code in Redis before transactions came along. So actually, handling kind of um, the locking problem now with transactions is a lot simpler. Um, but I, I still kind of like this example of, of doing this using um, set and x and get set. So the idea here is that um, the set and x call failed, i.e. there is already something in, um, there's already a, a value associated to that lock. Um, and so the question is, is that a valid value or is that an expired value? So you call get against that key uh, and you get the, the timestamp t1. That um, assuming that's in the past, um, you'd like to kind of you say okay, that's in 